now open for questions, points, um, about both the keynote as well as the two panelists that we've just heard. So um, please uh, raise your hand. I know MSF is not shy. Um, and then uh, um, we, we will ask you to say who you are and who you work for, just in case it's not MSF. We're going to start actually with um, a, a question from online. So Pete, please. Hi, um, this is just a clarification for Anne. Do people need to leave their homes, and I assume they mean the safe area, in order to obtain the material to carbonize? Yeah, correct. I don't know if it's on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the carbonization pl place is within the secured enclave and uh, uh, in agreement with the military and the, the community leaders chosen in a, in a central place. Yeah. Great. Thanks. So. You're, okay, so the woman with the very attractive little box, um, yes, that you have? Right, good. You want the box. The key is to have an attractive box on your lap, please. Hi, um, my name is Tish Shah. I'm in MSF and I also work as a doctor in the NHS and I'm part of the governance mechanism of uh, MSF. So I, uh, I'm gonna ask my question relating to organizational culture. Um, but before I do that, I want to thank you, all four of you. It has been, uh, I'm sitting here in awe and inspiration, so thank you first. Um, innovation, you showed that picture, Ben, of Uganda and all these millions of ideas and this overload of excitement, enthusiasm, innovation. And the response was to shut it down because we couldn't, they couldn't control how much, uh, how many good ideas are coming out. Um, you also talked about the processes and how much money and energy and to, to give to innovation and, and how does an organization stimulate it. Um, and it, it leaves me a little bit confused because you want to inspire it and uh, at the same time you are in the mess of, of the, the picture behind you and you have to get on with your day job as well. And. And how the question do we get that, is? Yeah, the, how do we get that balance right? And how do we, what is the organizational approach to, to stimulate that? Thanks. And Ben, I'm going to ask you to think deeply on that question while we take a few more and then we'll come back. Next. Gentleman in the center there with the, the blue t shirt of about five rows from, yeah, perfect. Hello. My, my name is David, MSF Sweden Innovation uh, Unit. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for really inspiring um, talks. Um, I have a question for uh, Am. Um, I was just wondering, um, how did you decide that this was the challenge you wanted to work around? Because a bit in relation to all the other presentations. I mean, we are quite quick often uh, to think that this is what is the most important challenge for the community. So I'm interested in the pre-step of it. Did you have discussions with the community on are this, is this really the challenge that uh, they would like uh, to be solved? Or is it something that we, as MSF, assumed, like we do quite often, that this is what they need? Uh, thanks very much, MSF Sweden. Good. So. Um, Ben, you've had a chance to reflect and very succinctly respond. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Was it Hisha? Tish. Tish. Um, so I think, I think it's about ethics and it's about discipline. So I agree that there is something positive about that picture, about the proliferation of effort and what it symbolizes. But there are lots of things that aren't great about it. If you think about that, that as the a medical equivalent of that would be putting a whole load of products and a whole load of treatments into the field without actually constructing any basis of experimentation, no evidence, no basis of comparison, a uh, huge amount of duplication, huge amount of potential waste, no consideration of what it was actually doing to the communities or the people that were actually involved. So in, in one instance, in, in one community, people have been given, in the same community, people were given five different mobile phones by different people going in and, and they had to swap their SIM cards between them in order to get the treatment uh, for, the, for, for the package of treatment that's available. So I think, I think it's good to channel the energy, but we need to do it with discipline and with a bit of rigor. 
Uh, and, and in that context, it should have been some means by which, um, in that case, probably the government setting priorities and people coming with evidence-based protocols for what they were going to do and how, how they were tested. Just because you're doing innovation doesn't mean you're playing tennis with the net down. Um, and I think from a medical point of view, I think it's about discipline and it's about ethics. You wouldn't do anything of that kind in the NHS. You wouldn't just roll out a whole range of different products without, without any rhyme, or maybe you would, but um, <laughs> raising your eyebrows. But therefore, we should, we should have the same kind of system. And I think it's contingent on us in places where they don't have those accountability systems and mechanisms as a humanitarian organisation to bring that to the, the forefront of humanitarian innovation. Thanks very much. And Anne, kind of the kind of decision-making process. Yeah, David, thanks for the question. Um, so how the question reach us is indeed through the mission itself. Uh, but of course, it in the mission and in the projects, the needs comes is observed and comes hopefully fully from the from the community. Um, with this kind of cases, sometimes it's challenging because uh, especially uh, gender-based violence is not something that the community talks about open. We see patients coming in, so we have uh, some sort of an indication that this indeed is a problem, but also we hear a lot of the stories of things going on. And it's not only the Nigeria mission that indicated this as a challenge, but also the other missions. So this is... Uh, uh, where we see, uh, where we get some sort of a confirmation that it, this is something to work on uh, and to dive into deeper. Of course, when on the ground, when starting the project, uh, we have to see and confirm uh, is this something that people want, uh, need, uh, and aspire. Yeah. Great, thanks. We have another online question. Uh, yeah, so this question is for Labana. Um, not everybody speaks the same language. Uh, did you, have you faced any challenges around language and how did you resolve it? And then I'm gonna abuse my power and ask a question myself. The facilitator in this process seems really important. What qualities does a facilitator need to do good social mapping? Great, and Dr. Stephen, before you answer, we'll see if we have any more questions from the audience. So I've got a, gentleman, a woman here on the left, yep, who's gonna get the turquoise cute box, and then we'll go to the gentleman in the green t-shirt. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Isabel. I'm the founder of Immersive Rehab. Uh, yesterday I asked a question as well about clinical trials, and it's related to that again. And I was wondering, so when you develop an innovation, um, and you do run through all the ethics and the trials, et cetera, which is important. Uh, it's already very, um, there's lots of constraints in uh, when you want to do it in Europe, in, in the US, going through CE marking FDA approvals. I was wondering how would you then approach it to uh, when you want to implement it in developing countries as well, uh, going through those ethics within those countries, which is also very important, but how to approach that from that point of view. So that was is there one in particular who that question is for? Uh, I guess Ben, yeah. Ben. Okay, yeah. good. Sir? Sure. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I'm a uh, TV doctor. I also do research um, in uh, using GIS methods and things and trying to connect patient experiences with... GIS Could you speak and louder and slower, please? Sure. Um, my name is Jeremy. I'm a TV doctor and I do GIS research using big data and trying to connect patients' experiences. Um, so my question is for Lavana. Could you just tell us about the GIS platforms that you used and what efforts um, you made to connect the community's knowledge outside of MSF and share with other organisations and other social mapping platforms? For example, EPAL in Malawi or the Humanitarian Open Source Mapping Initiative that MSF is involved in. Thanks. Dr. Stephen, over to you for two questions. Okay, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, the, the first question related to the sign language. I think um, through the experience, we did not meet with the, some people that uh, needed uh, that. And the, for the part of for the skills for the facilitators, the most important skill is the, the listening skill with patients. Um, also, 
like while well, facilitating the group. But he's not, he's not supposed to be judgmental in the way how he's facilitating the, the group. He has to be really open-minded to really listen to the people. And he, on part of sharing the experience within the, maybe the country, as at first really we tried within ourselves, later we also decided that uh, we should be involving the other people. Because like the second intervention that we had, we had the challenge of also language. <laughs> Uh, when we approached the northern part of the country where my, I could not speak that language, uh, we involved another organization which was also dealing with the research in that area, working the community. So we shared how to do it and uh, they quickly captured the information or the, the methodology and uh, we joined them in the community, and they were, it's them who were facilitating the process of uh, um, capturing the information and also engaging the community. And uh, systematically now, we are um, like also involving like the Minister of Health, so that as we are doing, they should be also learning the process. So within the country, we have been sharing the skill. Now within now our family at the international level. This is the great opportunity that we have. Um, yes, if you, people are motivated for that, we are there to share the practical experience on the ground. As I said, we tried in different areas. The displacement, the cholera, the floods, it means we have tried in all angles. Thank you, Dr. Stephen. And to wrap up with Ben, questions of um, ethics um, uh, in other countries outside of here. Yeah, um, there's actually quite a lot of research on this. Um, the three, I'm just looking at an article that's done by 3IE who lead impact evaluations, and they, they've concluded they reviewed a whole range of different RCTs in the humanitarian context. And they said while they while they're kind of practical and ethical limitations, there are some mixed approaches that can be used or blended approaches, quasi-experimental approaches or factorial designs. So there's things that can be used which are very specific to the humanitarian sector. I guess I can speak to that just based on work which I did looking at how MSF does, um, has been doing innovations in emergency disease responses. And the need to build and a whole range of different things from um, seasonal malaria treatments through to vaccine treatments and so on. And, and there were two things that stood out for me from the work that I was doing. It was interesting, actually, because when I was doing the research, there, were, there was the innovation wings of MSF, and then you had the operational research side. And I was having to look much more at the operational research side and realizing how little they speak to each other. And how some of the things that were really dramatically interesting and innovative on the mm -hmm. operational research side weren't called innovations. And I had to learn a lot of the language, not being a medic myself of that to identify that this was something new and different. That in itself was quite interesting. But there were two things that stood out. One was, um, one was preparedness and one was parallels. So on the preparedness side, what, what, being able to anticipate before an emergency hits, before a crisis hits, what would you need to do in order and to set up the necessary requirements so you're not actually trying to design and run a trial it's, uh, when, when in a crisis setting. And I think that's something that MSF's been pretty good at in a whole range of settings where there have been multi-year crises or the repeated crises or where there's been a long-term presence. They, there does seem to be some sense in which people are looking at the, the, the basis on which you can do trials and actually invest in that ahead of time. The other thing I think MSF's really good at is finding partial parallels to the crisis setting so that you can find, for example, hospitals with limited resources. You could find particular... Um, uh, almost developmental programming efforts where, where there are a partial parallel to a full-blown crisis. And MSF, in the examples I was looking at, was actually very good at saying, OK, well, we can do the trial there so that when the crisis hits, we can say, on the basis of the best available evidence, we can now use this in a, in a crisis setting. So those two things, preparedness and, and parallels, I guess, uh, are both things. But, they, but I'd encourage you to read the 3 IE stuff. It looks really interesting. Thanks, Ben. And we have come to the conclusion of this session.
So just very briefly, I want to observe that Ben likes to use the first letter of certain words. So he had CCCC of all of our challengers, collaborators. But then he also was using preparedness, partial parallels. So I'm noting this about you, Ben. Um, <laughs> uh, but really, at, at base, I think Ben has really talked to us about a history of innovation. We have some real hurdles that, as a community, we can do better um, sharing. Uh, breaking out some ways that we, I think, have not done it. Ben has also really picked up and emphasized the ethics and empathy, EE. -E. Um, <laughs> but of course, um, but, but really quite true. Um, Labana, um, Dr. Stephen, you know, thank you for the brilliant example of social mapping and that listening is possible in many emergencies and that sharing with authorities, with others, is also a critical critical part, and a creativity. So you're all picking up on innovation elements. And Anne, a great example of an iteration process, an important problem to solve, a new idea, some trialing, some challenges, piloting, and now a key issue in innovations, which is scale and dissemination. We rarely plan for that. And that, I think, from an ethical point of view, is actually quite important. So we are at the end of the first of four sessions today. Well-deserved coffee and tea are waiting for you. And can we have a huge thank you for our great keynote and panelists.